that you get when you eat bats in China. I'm rolling. Hey there, film fans. I'm Jeff. I'm Dave. And I'm John. And welcome to The Love of Cinema, a pod in which we'll challenge one another to discuss <laughs> movies, both new and old, with a strictly positive critical eye. That's right. And to avoid any lazy negativity, we're making this a drinking game. Any negative criticism about a film is absolutely allowed, but you will be called out for it, and you will have to take a fucking drink. Drink! Drink! Every time. Also... Reminder, uh, parental advisory, um, there will be some language. So if you or our parents, stop listening now. <laughs> so pour yourself a glass, join us, give it up for the film we love, and perhaps the films that need some love. Thanks yet again to our beer sponsor, Carlos Barroso, for brewing and providing us with all of our beer. Give him a follow on Instagram at Bar 2019 Awesome. That only, that only took one take this week. Hey! Yeah, we're back. We're back. <laughs> All right, on this week's episode, we're going to be discussing five movies, as usual, for our typical structure. The first contemporary movie we'll be discussing is Birds of Prey. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, wait, what's the subtitle? And the fantabulous emancipation of Not one anymore. Harley Quinn. Did they change that? Yes, they, it's, it's now Harley Quinn, Birds of Prey. All right, Harley they, Quinn, they, Birds yeah. of Prey. You can't even keep up with the title. The movie it'll be <laughs> correlating to... Our Kill Bill 1 and 2, that's right, we're calling them one big Kill Bill movie, as any hardcore Tarantino fan should. Second section is going to be Portrait of a Lady on Fire, paired up with the movie A Royal Affair, followed by our fantastic Redemption, which you will reveal at the very end, correct? Correct. Mm -hmm. So, first up, Birds of Prey. Birds of Prey. Or Harley Quinn. Harley Quinn. We, we knew after Suicide Squad, the best character in Suicide Squad gets a movie. That's what this is. I mean, which isn't yeah. saying much Su I mean, about Suicide. <laughs> but, but the, I mean, Suicide Squad. The thing is, Suicide Squad was that was the Harley origin story, and Birds of Prey is the DC fifty two Harley origin story because she's uh, a different character in the new. She really DC. is. Yeah, now, she, yeah. It's. I'm yeah. not sure how I felt about that. I'm gonna go ahead and pick up my drink. Oh, off to the drinking wait, game, Wait, huh? wait, wait, wait. What's going on? Uh, this movie didn't work for me. <laughs> okay, that means the right drinking off, game's on. Right off the bat, the whole point of the wow. podcast is positive. It's the first thing you said. It's the first thing I wanted it to. I I'm going to hate you I from this other dislike, table. Hold on, wait. Let me, let me clarify. I did not hate this movie. I did not dislike this movie. I just felt like everything they were trying to do... One, you're right. I, was, I did see Suicide Squad. So I thought I was going to go in and see a ridiculous terrible anti-hero doing what she did in suicide squad which was so there was something so enigmatic about what she was doing i couldn't put my finger on it it was sexy it was almost funny but in a messed up way mm -hmm. and i felt like with birds of prey they were trying to one they were copying deadpool like 100%. i'm calling negative on that 100 ah, percent. i'll keep it. drinking i don't know about 100 percent. maybe like 25 percent. they're like hi i'm an anti-hero i'm gonna give you a voiceover and try to explain why See, you should find... That was one of my favorite parts of it. Yeah. DC needs that. Okay. Well, go ahead. Finish up. And just to clarify very quickly, this is not, not a spoiler-free conversation. It is not spoiler-filled, but it's also not spoiler-free. So please refer to the times timestamps below if you want to skip ahead any of the movies we're talking about. The Deadpool is really funny. Yeah. Right, like that's why it's one reason why they get away with that structure is because yeah. it is sincerely no, nothing is two, nothing is Deadpool. There are two or three really funny scenes in both of the Deadpool's. The funny moments in this movie were never that funny to me. I, I was always on board. I was enjoying myself. I was laughing. The audience was enjoying themselves. Everybody had energy in the crowd, but it never cracked me up. So I wouldn't say there was a really hilarious scene. And then they were they're trying to to make it heartfelt, like to actually like care about what Harley Quinn was going for. It almost worked for me a couple times. And then the way they switched it at the very end, where she decided to betray them and go away, it just didn't seem clear to me. I was kind of hoping they were going to take me on board with her, and she was going to kind of turn over a new leaf and be a little conflicted about how she was starting to care about those girls. And then they flipped it at the very end, and I felt like it was gimmicky. It just didn't, hmm. it didn't land. It didn't line up with the thing they had done for the rest of the movie to get me there. I was ready to kind of care about her and this crew of ladies. And then she just abandons them and they did it for like a glamour shot with sunglasses in a car. I don't know. It right. just felt like it felt inconsistent. I wasn't quite sure if they were trying to do what Deadpool did or if they were trying to do something totally new. And it almost did something new for me. It just didn't quite get right. there. I enjoyed it. I did enjoy myself. I had a fun time watching that movie in the theater. Yeah. Well, well, Dave, I imagine you've read a lot of the comics, if not all of the comics. Um, not a lot of the comics, no. But I mean, I know a lot of the DC like 
Yeah. And I saw Suicide Squad with you, and we uh-huh. both came. I, we went in with not lowered expectations, but we had already seen all the reviews. So they Suicide Squad. Became you went in weird... with lowered expectations. I, okay, fine. Squad. I personally went in with lowered <laughs> expectations <laughs> because after like the Zack Snyder, this was like DC's chance at redemption, and it just you know all of the origin stories in Suicide Squad sort of became vignettes. Like all of the characters basically got these like three minute origin stories because they didn't want to do all of the origin stories, but then it just got a little sloppy. I was like, is Deadpool the lead in this? They clearly knew Harley, De- uh, not Deadpool, Jesus Christ, is Deadshot. The, <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. Um, Will Smith? Yeah. I, I was like, he was I mean, kind they, of the lead in that yeah, movie, they, but they Harley cast, Quinn was obviously the Will best Smith. character. He's the lead. Yes. Yeah, but then the Joker was like their secret weapon, even though he wasn't. His, it was just a little sloppy, but it was really, really, really fun. So this one, I was excited to see what they would do when they went into the first person. And what I would say is they didn't. They made an interesting choice that you don't see a lot in the comic book movies, at least to me, which is they they kept the reality pretty normal to what I imagine, I don't know, our existence in Earth to be like. Whereas like Zack Snyder's Gotham was so bleak. It was like Tim Burton, but weirder. And like it was just bizarre. And then like the Christopher Nolan also really, 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 really dark. Um, whereas this, it, everything seemed pretty normal to real life, except for her. She was the exception to that rule. So even like the crazy sequences, rather than them happening in sort of an alternate universe, they just happened in a fun home. Like it, it was, I don't know, it, it was interesting to me because she as a character was still exciting to root for in this film, even though I don't know if I bought the world, if that makes sense. But because she was so enticing and because she really felt like a fish out of water, like I think she was kind of a marvel and she, you, you were able to follow her and really follow her. You're saying her. you didn't like the, like the, the realism? Of like the world? No, I was okay with the choice because it made her seem zanier. It made her seem wackier without them doing what it seemed like they did with Joker and Suicide Squad, which was just like zaniness for zaniness's effect you know what i mean Mm -hmm. just like to be crazy because he's the joker like in this case she just seems like a wild crazy villain that just happens to almost blend in with society i don't know it it worked for me even though it seemed not lazy but it seems a little um uh passive it seemed like they just they were relying on her for sure in the film but it worked because she was so enticing that's what i would say dave on to you um i think there were a lot of points that were missed when you when you watch this. I mean, great. It's <laughs> wow. she's, she's Harley Quinn. I'm gonna she's, I'm gonna drink for you. She's not throwing a shade. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah. You drink because I, I yeah yeah. Um, no, go ahead. She's she's insane. Mm-hmm. Um, and this is this is Harley down and out becoming the character that she becomes. I mean, of course she drove off at the end. Like what 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 are you gonna do? It's it's the the frog and the scorpion. It's like take me across the river. I stung you. Oh, sorry, it's my nature. <laughs> like that that it was meant to happen. There's, there are so many good things that happen in this movie. Ewan McGregor Ewan was, a, fun. was amazing to me in this movie because he's so charming and cute and a little bit campy and then he just snaps on the turn of a dime. And they really portrayed like all the men in this film as over-the-top assholes. <laughs> and at first I was like, okay, they're really going over the top with this. And I was like, well, actually, no, that's probably what women deal with on a daily basis in the workforce. Yeah, it was very feminist, for sure. The movie yeah. was very feminist. Oh, absolutely. I mean, it's, you know. Well, did you, do you know the Black Mask character that Ewan McGregor's role is based off of? Because he did, he did seem, I mean, I don't know, bipolar seems like a terrible way of describing it, but he was... He was unpredictable, to say the least. Yeah. yeah. I mean, there's a certain scene that happens in the club in the middle of the movie. I won't go into too much detail, but I was really uncomfortable. Yeah. Like it I went don't know past if I was good it, uncomfortable, it but went, I'm with yeah, you. It went, it was, I, it yeah, went see, past I, the point of... I know what you're saying, but I think that's... If you have to have an intellectual justification while watching something, then it, it's a there's a disconnect. So I think he, he... I didn't like the way they made the guys act like that. It fell into the, the point you just made about Suicide Squad. It fell... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, sure, definitely. We're sure. getting fucking negative right here. This is like we're like we're gonna be positive about movies, and John's like, I didn't like this movie. It didn't work for me. It didn't work for me. Yeah, they they really shouldn't have given me the no, positive no, no, for this no, segment. Please. No, no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead. It's fair. He, I love you and McGregor in general. He's usually the person I say that he's 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 always one of my favorite parts about most movies. I'm definitely in that camp with the Star Wars stuff. I think Same. he's one of the best things and about beginners, that series. Beginners, beginners, underrated mm. performance. I, lo- I love Ewan McGregor. I think he's a super talented, charming actor that is underused. I don't think he gets used enough. Mm. I think he fell into the trap. I'm not saying it's him. I don't know if the director pushed him in this direction, but the thing you just said about the Joker and Suicide Squad, they did it again with him in yeah. this. It didn't. I never felt uh, scared. Um, I'm, I'm with you. I think it's I know what you mean about direction. the uncomfortable. Yeah. Yeah, I, I, I know what you mean. That I wasn't scared. Was uncomfortable. I was uncomfortable. I but would... I think there was something 
I was never worried. I never feared yeah, him. Yeah, I never was worried I, I, at I'm all. I'm with you on that. That's fine. It, yeah, so I don't know. I felt like it was a little cliche. It kind of felt gimmicky. Again, it felt gimmicky. Which, if she mm. is the gimmick to this movie, then let her anchor it. Don't let them... I feel like there were right. other there were other characters that they kept trying to... to Mostly the men, mostly the antagonists, because the women around her were not. And I loved that, that she was the anchor of their group and that a lot of the other girls were very grounded in... There was some silliness, of course, to the writing and stuff. There's some comedy in it, but they were grounded in their characters. Mm -hmm. What's that one you love so much? Um... The, uh, the one in black, the, the Huntress. The Huntress. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, she was nuts. I, I, mean, I mean, I was a little concerned at first about the character, like the characterization of it. And then I realized what they were doing. And I was like, yeah, she has issues. She the has, character of Huntress? Yeah, or, she has yeah. real, real issues. Mm-hmm. Like she's raised by assassins in the woods, basically. Right. Like, and, and she was a cool device was because she sort of, we, we learned more about her as we went. Whereas at yeah. very early on, it was like Harley like is going to pave this road. And then they were, they used Huntress well, where it's like the longer the movie went, yeah. you were slowly revealing, they were slowly revealing. More I also about love her. that they didn't overuse Canary. Yeah. Cause Canary can wipe the floor with people and they really like, they used it when it counted. Yeah. What do you think of Rosie Perez as um the detective that's working with them? Cause I feel like she fit in yeah, like, to the team. She, she, she did a good job. She was yeah. doing everything she could to be. She, sort was, of the she was almost the straight guy. Yeah, exactly. Or yeah, yeah. straight girl in this case. Right. Mm-hmm. Sorry, yeah. that's a yeah classic mis- term. Yeah. Drink. Sorry. The terminology hasn't been updated yet. Um, but we are wait, we're getting off of Margot. Margo. And so there was a lot of fun stuff. So for instance, okay, the one sequence that I'm sure people are gonna be talking about is when she needs to get information, but she needs to go into the police station to uh-huh. to find out information about a character i'll just say that and she walks in and she basically throw like what what, what do we call that she has this weapon it's a beanbag gun yeah. it's a beanbag gun but With the like beanbag confetti. sprays <laughs> this confetti slash smoke and they're all different colors the colorist dave's a day here our resident uh film extraordinaire especially in post-production work our resident colorist specifically the color in this movie was really really cool I and mean, that scene in particular she's walking through the hall while just clouds of colorful smoke are everywhere and she's literally clearing out a police station i haven't that was re- fun i like, haven't researched that but i'm pretty sure a lot of that was done in camera Oh looks, yeah, yeah. It looks yeah. Like, it was yeah. Camera. like they and, they went full practical. Like I've got yeah. some stuff later on that we'll talk about. Yeah. And I'm with John that I wasn't scared a lot of the movie, which I think does help this to raise the stakes. But I had fun during that scene. I like had, there was I so much fucking fun during, during the scene. most of this film. I had fun too. But uh, all right, that scene is a perfect example of the the Suicide Squad. I feel like we all talked about it. I remember the three of us saw it, and that movie would not exist if they didn't have all those needle drops. Suicide Squad leans on that soundtrack. That's that okay. movie is terrible without yeah. all that music in it. Okay. This was one of the only sequences in this movie where when it started, I was like, this is fun. Yeah. It went on too long for me. Okay. And it was relying on the needle drop. I felt like I got what she was doing within mm-hmm. the first couple times she did it. And it just kept going. And there were several other sequences like that where it was just, I wasn't quite sure why I was watching the action. I'm not gonna lie. It felt like Joel Shoemaker's Batman Forever. Some of it to me, like, really stylized oh, so and in certain the places yeah, yeah, you're so close buzzer. to the buzzer <laughs> <Yeah>. certain <laughs> places it worked and I feel like there's there's other times where it just it it felt like it needed to rely on the gimmick and that disappointed me because I was excited to watch a movie about Harley Quinn she was the best character uh, that came out of Suicide Squad mm. and they threw her into her gimmick piece I felt like there was so much more they could have done with her character that could have been more specific and more interesting than relying on needle drops slow motion action sequences and the turn at the very end. I disagree with you. Mm. I think they could have achieved emotionally what you're talking about. The conflict she has. Like, she is going to ultimately do that without making it so cliche for her to just drive, sneak out the back and drive away with the girl and pretend like that whole movie didn't happen. I feel like there was something they could have done. Because now I don't know why I want to see the next one. I, mean, I assume they're going to make You know who others, that girl right? is, right? That's, uh, that is future Batgirl. Wait, which no one? one else no. knows wait, which one? Yeah. Well, no wait, one else. Wait, 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 no one knows Cassandra that. Cassandra Cain uh, is one of the Batgirl incarnations. No one knows that. Wait, the pickpocket? <laughs> yeah. Oh no, I'm I'm ready to drink because I thought she was bad. I she thought she was bad. Was yeah. Say it. You already said it. Yeah. Oh, here's the, yeah, I'll yeah, drink. I'll drink. drink. Now here's the thing. That was the only bad performance in the movie, in my opinion. I thought Here, the here's other... the thing. She she looked right. She, it was everything about it was right. The way she pickpocketed looked natural. Like they did a good job with her doing that but when she had to do dialogues when she had to say lines you could and, when she and, had to act yeah she had to act yeah yeah <laughs> Well, because there's more. I mean, you know these. No, well, we know that fucking drink. Yeah. That was that was that was mean you know, as well. TV, you know when you see like a TV. You know when you see somebody who's like good at it, like you famous for a role, and you see them do something else, and you go, "Ooh, oh, they're just that's that works for them, and this doesn't." Um, 
Yeah, she she uh, saying dialogue lines is not her thing. But but she looks right. I'm, I'm trying what to. What does I'm trying that to even mean? Dude? Yeah, you're trying to be. All right, uh, I'm I'm to, okay, we're going, we're going around mean? in circles. I feel like we should move. All, like we we've set up is we should move on to the comparative. Yeah, 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 we should. I still think this movie was fun, but yeah, I, I'm 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 with you, John. My bar was just too. My bar was low. My bar I was low, like but it. I had fun. Dave, Dave really had fun. I had a great time. Dave had fun. I had fun. I even stayed. I even stayed in the credits. It. Go see it in the theater. Yeah. This thing is worth seeing in the theater if you're gonna go watch it. it Everyone's gonna so have too. a good time. Yeah. My audience had a good time. The sound is cool. The colors cool, and even like the work on the pier through the fog. Like a lot of that stuff was pretty cool. I like that. That scene was. I liked that where they were chasing him in the. Yeah, basically Harley is chasing you and our villain through the fog and can't find him through the fog it was really cool it was really well done and it harkened back to a lot of the comic book movies of the old like the 80s and 90s Tim Burton stuff it was cool mm. okay our comparative film <laughs> Kill Bill 1 Kill Bill 2 yes um, I don't I even will, know if we really need to set this up too much because yeah, I think but people know when one movie lore. is not enough Mm-hmm. Um, I dare I start John I'm sure loved this movie what, okay Dave why don't we start with you what do you think I was ready to hate this again because the first time I saw it I hated it and okay. I didn't Oh, I, like yeah, I know. I I I go. I'm prone to anti Tarantino rants occasionally. Right. But I think it's more about okay, he makes good films, but stop talking. You know what I was worried about? Mean, Sorry, go ahead. Clarify that look because I think I know what you mean. Yeah, but like, I don't want to project. He, like he he makes great films. In interviews, he comes across as oh my god, I know, horrible. <laughs> yeah, it's that. Um, it's just job, and, <laughs> and a child, and but also like sometimes dialogue for the sake of dialogue. But this right. and like I resetting through the the animation techniques when they swapped over to like the stories with the animation and it was just beautiful the animation was one of my favorite segments so first things first if you have never seen any of these movies very on um tarantino brand he does it in chapters so i would actually recommend just planning for the two movies and almost watching them like a mini series so you can watch two chapters a night typically the chapters deal with um the bride who's uma thurman's character dealing with one particular character um so the story is she's seeking revenge because she was attacked and somebody tried to murder her on her wedding day. Um, but she lived. She woke up in a, out of her coma four years later and she was pregnant with child. The child is not in her anymore. And she's so furious that her wedding, somebody tried to murder her on their wedding day. And then she lost her baby that she seeks revenge to kill all of the people who tried to kill her, who happened to be her former sort of coworkers because they're all deadly assassins. So she has to go through and kill all the level bosses. Yes, that's right. So that's, that's the speech more or less. And so for me, I actually went into it, um, similar, not, not, I, I was probably on board with ex- assuming it was going to be great, but I view most Tarantino movies in such a way, and I think he knows this, as if there's a watermark that just says Quentin Tarantino across every frame. Because um, <laughs> there is. I, and actually, this is my this is my opinion. I'm ready to drink. I didn't love Once Upon a Time in Hollywood as much as everybody else, and I kind of think part of the appeal of it, maybe subliminally for a lot of people, was... It didn't feel like a movie that had Quentin Tarantino's name written across it. It just seemed like a good, classic, awesome, well done movie by a skillful person. Whereas this, for instance, so this is basically like a kung fu movie meets a grindhouse film with a little bit of um, Western thrown in and a lot of other elements. So this is clearly somebody who's brilliant. This is clearly somebody who's done his homework, has done his research, every single thing. There, There is literally a line in this movie where she says... Um, I don't think you have the stamina. You won't be able to last five minutes. And the entire fight sequence lasts four minutes and 59 seconds. So this is somebody who is obsessive. And you can tell. Yeah. I love this movie so, so much more. And I think it was just that, like, he really went for making a fantastic film based on everything he's seen. Like, but rather than turn it into a film school project of, like, see, I can make a kung fu movie. He basically went, yeah, but I want to do this. And he just made yeah. choices that were so deliberate and interesting. And the fact that every chapter was a little bit different than the chapter before. I found Again, it- thinking about it like a miniseries, I think it really works. Because movie one and two, most people who've seen these movies know are very, very different. Mm. One tends to be a little bit more action, which is great. They front load the excitement, including one of the crazy fight sequences ever caught on film <laughs> all the while while somebody without an arm is bleeding yeah, out loosely inspired by monty python and the holy grail sure yeah, sure <laughs> and in the second movie they sort of backtrack and fill in more and flesh it out it's it's so good thinking about it but just the fact that all of the chapters were a little bit different i mean this this i really thought i was gonna just be like oh it's fucking tarantino just being brilliant doing his own thing i i can't believe like it's it's one of the best tarantino movies for sure john yeah i mean um Apparently, first of all, apparently this was supposed to be one movie when he originally wrote it. It was going to be some epic film, and then and Miramax wanted to split it up into two. Well, he was inspired by the Sergio Leone um, 
which one was it? Hand, Fistful of Dollars. And so he kind of wanted like the four hour epic Western, but a Kung Fu. Once Upon a Time in the West. No, I think it was he, his homework assignment for the cast was Fistful of Dollars. Oh, nice. Yeah. But anyway, he wanted like those old school Westerns that had intermission. Like that's what he had in mind. Sorry, please continue. Um, no, yeah. I mean, it's a, <laughs> this might be, I can never, every time I go back over Tarantino's movies, I can't decide if this is definitely my favorite one. Um, it's super compelling just the way it's split up into the chapters this is one of the best openings to any movie ever dude <laughs> that, that the way that movie opens mm-hmm. i mean give me a break the going right into uh uh sinatra's what's what's her name frank sinatra's daughter and she sings um oh shit bang bang mm-hmm. uh, coming right into that yeah. i mean the music's music. ridiculous yeah I mean, it's so movie. good robert i think robert it's rodriguez a did the music for the song <laughs> For both of these movies. I, I do have to ask though, like Bill is a horrible shot, right? Like I'm not spoiling anything to say Bill's yeah, a horrible yeah, shot. Yeah, yeah. yeah I'm kind of wondering yeah. if he drank. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> must, yeah. Yeah. This is not a spoiler free conversation, so hopefully you've seen this movie by now. I'm oft- I've often wondered if And if you haven't, I just spoiled the first five seconds. Yeah. I've often wondered if Bill heard her. If he heard what she said and he just flinched just a little bit and moved his gun just a hair so that it it didn't go like straight through her forehead because like clearly like it hit right. this it grazed mm. the side of her head right yeah yeah um but nonetheless the opening to this movie is crazy that i've heard quentin tarantino say before that he they were like what makes you nervous about like the filmmaking stuff when you're actually in production and you're on sets do you get nervous what parts of filming make you nervous and he said that the dialogue driven actor scenes he's never nervous about those because one he he, he wrote said them. it. He wrote, <laughs> he wrote it, and he often gets to work with some of the best actors that have ever lived. So mm-hmm. he has so much faith in what they do. The scene work is usually good. He said that he only gets nervous about the massive set pieces. Yeah, and it's fun listening to him talk about Kill Bill because this was his. You know, he really wanted mm-hmm. to make his homage to his favorite martial arts movies, mm-hmm. and I think he topped him. I think this is as good as so yeah. many of the classic seventies martial arts movies. That scene with the crazy eighty hates. Yeah, it's like five different fight scenes. Mm. Packed into the last hour of this film. This is yeah, how is that not boring? Th- th- as an is... idea, if I put that on the whiteboard and we're trying to develop a movie, and I told you the last hour of this film is going to be different fight sequences yeah. with the I'll same person yeah. or yeah. same person's people, uh, person's henchmen people, right. we would have all said, "My God, we got to move. We, how are we going to move story forward with that last hour just being a fight scene?" <laughs> And it uh, absolutely does. Well, I think an inferior filmmaker would do what tends to happen a lot in our action movies now, which is they just think the more the merrier when it comes to fight sequences. So the more people, the more death, the more violence. It's great. He does such a good job of laying out the story where, for instance, in that fight, you have... It's almost like um, like video game terminology where you have like bosses. So you almost have, it's like, okay, so um, Lucy Liu's character has sort of henchmen and then she has an army. So it's like the army is to get to the henchmen and then once she gets through the henchmen, she can get to Lucy Liu. And so there is very intricate storytelling going on throughout the fight sequence. So it's not just like, oh, she has to use this one samurai sword to kill 90 people and then she gets to fight Lucy Liu. It's like, there's so much more going on to it. And again, the whole time, the first person is literally losing an arm. So it's very very violent it's very bloody it's very gory oh yeah but it's still very cinematic and it's still very like cohesive it's very clear what's going on it's very like the attention to detail well he started working he started at least brainstorming during um during uh, uh pulp. Pulp, fiction. pulp fiction yeah with uma thurman on set so it was it was her idea actually like how about bride on her wedding tries to get murdered wakes up oh she's a deadly assassin and he went boom <laughs> like literally that was it <laughs> thanks um, uma <laughs> yeah, exactly. So that's why she's called the bride and they never say her name. And so little things, I was worried, like they bleep out her name. So they say her name in the movie and they bleep it out. So there's all these things where I'm like, is that cheesy yeah. or not? I can't, but I just... Yes. You think it is? <laughs> okay, Dave's drinking. That's great. And and like little things like that, like like David Carradine who plays Bill literally will say her name, but it'll go, it'll like, oh, it was a weird sound effect. It shit me to tears. Yeah, but no, but here's the thing. A lot of those Kung Fu movies had bad sound effects. Like he even wanted to have some of those characters be yes, but dubbed they name their poorly. characters. <laughs> I know, I know, I know. Again, it's his, it's always him, right? This is his passion project. He's going to do whatever he wants to do. Some things you're going to be on board for, some things you're not. That's what happens when he gets this specific and this crazy. But just for me, this worked. I knew this was going to be good because my brother loved this movie. He had like a poster. I knew it was going to be good. And I just avoided watching it for whatever reason. I can't believe it because... I, I think mean, this is also a good... I mean, all of his movies are violent. And if you don't like violence in movies, then... It's a separate conversation. Yeah. Obviously, you should just don't watch movies that are violent. So I, I, I hate it when people bring that criticism to the table, but 
this is a good example of what I love about Quentin's violence. It's intense and it's in your face, but it's consequential. When Uma gets hurt, she actually gets hurt. Yeah. Mm. And you see her struggle throughout the end. When she hurts other people, he rides this line. He has found a way to make repulsive emotional violence that affects you because it's so mm -hmm. visceral. I mean, there's, funny. There's also that one style he uses where it's like the camera pans away and you're like, oh, okay, the violence is happening off camera. But no, we're going to cut right back to it in the middle of the violence. It's mm -hmm. like, psych, we're mm -hmm. back. There you go. Tongue stretch in People your face. People scream. There's blood. Yeah. Like, it's not just for the sake of the laughs. It's not just for the sake of the special effects of showing blood splurting everywhere. It's something that if you... <laughs> I know this sounds crazy, but as, as, as heightened as his movies are, if she were to actually have found herself in that situation in real life, and if she did have the ability to kill 88 people, it would be as disgusting as he makes it seem. It yeah, would be no, sure. horrible to watch. It would be horrible to live through. And by the end of it, the best part of it, go back to my point earlier about moving the story forward, you are nervous for her to go face Lucy Liu after she takes on that army. You don't think it's possible. Right. In the, in the silence, in the stillness, in that final scene with them, I in the snow. It's just juxtaposing uh, the craziness yeah. that it happened, the, the quiet. Oh my God, he just earns this whole other tone coming out of the very end. So again, imagine just on paper, the idea of having the last hour of this movie just full of violence. And then like six or seven line exchanges between them and then the movie's over. And he does something totally different, which just sets up this whole new thing mm -hmm. for going into the second volume. That thought was just so masterful masterful this is so much more than a martial arts movie. especially especially in two where he goes back and we find a little bit more about the origin the stakes are very high that opening of 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 the second chapter especially like the long shot the long it's like in the chapel um it's just like it's so peaceful and serene and idyllic and it's it's nice and then when the violence comes in it kind of gets you a little bit it's me and, and you I, don't even see that violence just the crane shot up and away. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know what's happening. They all walk inside that sweet shot. Yeah, yeah. and then front. and then when mm -hmm. she does the training sequence after seeing a lot of this. Yeah, like the training was. Let's a I want to hear you. the Pai Mei sequence. The Pai Mei the... caught me off guard because that was very kung fu, where he's like, oh, and he has all the isms. So he's like, and you know, that's the same actor who played the leader of the Crazy Eighty Eight in the first one. Yeah, I saw that because I was like, so which was wait, cool. which one is he? It confused me for a second. Yeah. Um, I mean, the training sequence, I kind of wanted more, and this is going to be ridiculous, but I kind of saw that sequence, and I was like, oh my god, Mulan nailed it, because Mulan's fucking training sequence <laughs> looks a lot like it, where they cut, and like she's like leaping in the air, and there's like a red background. Like, it's literally straight up. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. I was like, whoops, this but is, am but, I insensitive but here? But the Pai no? how do they get to the Pai sequence? After being, mm. spoiler, spoiler, when the she's spoiler. fucking buried alive. yeah, yeah. yeah. The tension again. He God, he's so good at switching back and forth between those things. Yeah. It takes you so patiently into her being buried alive, which yeah. is terrifying, and it still bothers me every time I watch that. To her freaking out, s silencing herself, getting quiet, and remembering yeah. her training, yeah, going would... into the Pai Mei. Okay, sequence. so we spent yeah, so we yeah, spent we way too much time, time, time talking on the first part of this, and no, we're not going to get into the second too much. Right. Um, but basically, I get the feeling that if you liked Harley Quinn. It doesn't matter. This is going to be a good <laughs> movie to see, yeah. regardless. We, we chose like, this for like this, the... this, this. This wasn't a comparison. This was an easy A. This was an yeah, yeah. But it was also like if you saw Harley Quinn and you loved that like feminist like protagonist it is, character. Yeah, it is definitely it's a similar sort of thing. Like I mean, Harley has the entire city after her once her protections yeah. are gone. The, it's the opposite. She's after everyone else. Mm. All right, to cut you off. So why should you see Kill Bill, John? Because it's fucking awesome, <laughs> Jeff. I think look at view it like a miniseries, and I think it's just go along for the ride and have some fun. Cool. All right, we're gonna take a quick break. When we come back, we will be discussing Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Hey, friends, we are back, and the next contemporary film we are going to be talking about is. A movie called Portrait of a Lady on Fire. Bravo. And uh, just just quick interjection, Jeff. This is a French film. Oh shit! Just just it just, was just so you know. I don't yeah. know, guys. I Wait, think this I isn't a British movie. war epic. <laughs> hold on, hold on a second. Uh, okay, so um, the quick summary is: it is a movie about an 18th century French painter who's young, named Marianne, who is commissioned to paint. Um, a young lady who has been um, 
sold to marriage what do you, what do you even call that she, she's going to be married to somebody she hasn't met yet and she's gonna have to move arranged sold yeah, yeah sure sold <laughs> shit yeah pretty <laughs> much this is, what, this is what happens no, when you have a drinking game in our podcast so um she the the um the bride the future bride doesn't want to be painted she's very sad about the arranged marriage and so the painter has to go to this island and she has to paint this young lady without her knowing she's being painted. So she basically has to do that by forming a friendship with her and then observing her appearance and then painting in private and their casual friendly observations turn into a very romantic love story. I'm I'm still aching. This is the, this is the kind of movie that makes me want to go see other movies. This is the kind of movie movie that makes me want to see more foreign film. This is the kind of movie that makes me ultimately want to also make movies. I mean, every single thing aesthetically about how this was put together. How about the opening? The the sketches, the beginning of sketches and then cut to a blank page again. Yeah. Like she wasn't mm-hmm. like we if you even if you didn't know that plot, which I think some people who are going to go see this probably won't know the full extent of what the plot of this movie is about. The way that sets the tone for how to begin, how to how to start. Not just physically how to begin drawing a picture, but how to create a relationship. Mm -hmm. The whole thing about this movie that is so interesting from start to finish is that we have a protagonist we're following around, the painter, and we are desperately trying to understand what her angle is. If she think if she's if she sees herself strictly as a professional, if there is something that she is looking for, if there was any kind of premeditated, you know, consciousness to her desire for this subject she has. Or if this is literally just about her journey as an artist, it turns into something so much more than that. I think this movie, any good movie about art, is going to eventually try to show you that life and process and the actual craft are all going to be, bleed into one giant thing. And I think she pulls that off so well. I feel like the um, there's so many great, great lines in here. Oh, yeah. The uh, When they were talking about the scene about Orpheus and Eurydice... That's a major theme throughout the whole thing. Oh my God, which you don't yeah. even really get to until like that movie. That happens like halfway through. Yeah, the movie. it really does. They, the yeah. first half of this movie is slow. If you're somebody who doesn't have a lot of patience, it, it is it? slower than the latter half of this movie. It's slow, but not boring. I like, agree. It's, it's still super it really compelling. Builds. Yeah. You know what? This film, so just to interject really quick to everybody, um, part of the reason we're watching this movie is this movie got released last year and it was um, snubbed. It was supposed to be up for best foreign language film, but for some reason, the French selection was a movie called Les Miserables. Um, which so is supposed this, to be great none of us have seen that yet yeah for sure yeah. Um, this film got a BAFTA nomination it got a Golden Globe nomination it got a Cannes Award at the Palme d'Or it was nominated it, for it got, the Palme d'Or it was nominated for the Palme d'Or and I think it won Best Screenplay it's best, yeah, it yeah. Did. so it, this was this was a very successful movie but for some reason when it comes to foreign language films without the Oscars it's like we, we it's hard to break through but I saw this in a packed theater in New York um, recently in, in February and it was awesome I saw it with somebody who has never seen I saw it with Chloe never seen a foreign language film loved it so much and this is a great example First of all, if you like period pieces, 18th century France is probably something that you're going to be interested in. Um, and also, this is a great example of show, don't tell. So part of the reason it's... I don't know where they're going at the beginning. Like, mm. she's in an art gallery. I don't know where. It doesn't tell me. There's no voiceover. And then she gets on a boat, and she's on a boat. And then she gets off the boat. And then the house that the bride is staying in, you don't even really see it. There's no, I don't think there's a single exterior of the house or abbey because she was sort of being raised by nuns in a convent. Um, I, I don't see that at all. But you know what you see? You see eyes in every single shot. Um, our painter, you don't know what she's in it for. You don't know where she comes from. But you're just so, you can't take your eyes off of it. You're so curious. There's so much intention behind every single thing everybody does in this film that it's like, you, you need to know what's going on next. And it's 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 brilliant. Anyway, Dave. I mean, the thing I love most about this is everyone is raving about how beautifully it's shot. Mm-hmm. And it's now we have definitive conclusive proof that you can shoot that level of beauty on a digital camera. Mm-hmm. Because ah. this was all shot on red. Really? Yeah, it was nice. shot on a red in 7K. Wow. 7K. Yeah. Yeah. I didn't know that. I mean, yeah. some of those shots of those eyes, like I'm the portrait shots. Yeah. Or yeah. So when the she's portrait close-ups, when she, <laughs> yeah, eventually I mean, she poses anything inside the house was oh, yeah. beautiful. Like my favorite shot almost in the entire movie happens in the first, I want to say five minutes Yeah, uh, when she's on the boat heading towards the Island and the ocean rolls down and reveals the beach. I'm like, how long they would have sat there for that shot for to them, work. Yeah, for it to naturally yeah. the yeah. slip up. And like that that's a level of filmmaker patience I really ought to respect. Yeah. Which is if we're just gonna if we're just gonna lean into this, I think it's safe to say I watch a lot of foreign film. There is a expectation of patience 
that foreign film markets have the luxury of having that you do not have in America. So I'm not even saying that they knew that shot was going to work, but they had the discipline and the uh, mm -hmm. luxury of saying, well, let's give it a shot because if we pull mm -hmm. it off, it could work. And our audiences won't be mad if we pull it off. Yeah. Whereas they wouldn't even spend the day or two days to shoot that in yeah. America. It's even like because scenes, of the risk. Scenes on the beach, like the, the sun is coming from like a 30 degree angle off the horizon. Mm -hmm. Like they would have had two, three hours a day Maximum. Right. of that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And was it worth it? It was worth it. I'm it sure was this, absolutely you know, worth it. Small... Everything looked beautiful. Yeah. Like, if you want to see something that was spectacularly shot and it's like, when they say it's slow, it's slow, but it's well paced for what's happening and yeah. it really builds you into when it picks up. And the reason, it, it, I mean, it doesn't, it's slow on purpose, obviously, oh, yeah. because this is a story about two people who didn't realize that they were going to be drawn to each other being drawn. Nothing is projected ahead of time. Nothing is you, displayed before yeah. you. It you happens feel so every organically. every minute of it. So what happened, and there's even, they even call it out, this is so meta. This, 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 they knew it was good enough to do this, even in the writing of the screenplay, because this isn't the screenplay. It happens so slowly, their attraction to each other, and then finally crossing the line to start touching, and then finally crossing the line to start kissing, and eventually making love. That in the one of the last scenes of the movie, they literally ask, have a conversation about when did you think the first time I wanted to kiss you was? And then you as an audience member are going back and thinking, yeah. when did I think was the first time they even acknowledged to themselves, I am super attracted to this person mm -hmm. and I want them. And I was going through with them in the in the scene, trying to think of how I felt when they were talking, when they were guessing for each other about which time the other one wanted, because they knew yeah. they had felt they had fulfilled it. Just a few things I want to rant out here. When she, they're talking about uh, Orpheus and Eurydice and the tale. And anyone who doesn't know that, when Orpheus goes down to get Eurydice from Hades, he's coming back up. Hades makes a deal with them. You can't turn around. She will be behind you. She will follow you. You can take her back out to the land of the living. But if you turn around to see if she's behind you, she's gone. And everyone knows that tale. There's been a lot of other things based on it. And then they say the line, perhaps he made a choice to remember her over loving her. The poet's choice, hmm. which was just thematically... Whenever you're talking about unrequited love and if it's ever going to come back or not. I mean, of course, that's just a fucking mountain of gold to mine. But again, the courage they had. The follow up to, to that as well it. was like maybe it was her choice. Right. I which mean, then mm -hmm. leads towards yeah. basically how the that film ends, which I won't go into. But mm -hmm. uh, it that entire story ties the entire ending of this film together, which also, is beautifully done. When when two people are falling in love and they're telling the story and they make those arguments, they're like, well, maybe uh, maybe it was her choice. Maybe, uh, yeah, yeah. It, it's hot. Like, it's it's steamy. <laughs> I'm serious. It's, it's sitting there and it's like, oh, oh, they want they want each other. <laughs> they want it. Oh, my God. They want it so bad. It, I yeah, mean, yeah. It I starts would... having... Go ahead. It just has commentary on love in general, doesn't it? Like, this is... Is there something more cinematic and more poetic about unfulfilled relationships mm -hmm. but is there something where the stakes seem mm -hmm. higher and the echo is a little bit louder if you're not having to deal with the day-to-day -day because you had the fire and the passion and only the memory of that also let's not discuss uh how this film actually winds up because if people do go and see it i want them to sit through every second of this journey yeah. because it's so worth the payoff yeah, yeah, and like yeah. I, knew, I knew obviously that they were gonna. It was a love story. This, so this like started. Much an, way. This started but, an hour long discussion in my house. The way like, they, yeah, the way they build, it's it's so not simple. It's very realistic. It's very specific to their relationship. It's not generic in any way, shape, or form. Um, so what I would say is because I also felt that it was a little slow. There, were, there wasn't a lot of dialogue early on. Um, just give yourself over to it. Just do it, especially yeah. for the first fifteen minutes. Just give yourself fifteen minutes. Don't ask any questions. Just sit there, and I bet you you'll just be washed in. Yeah, just be, this like, is this in. is not a Marvel film. This is not oh, an it's action. Not. Film. This is the other thing. <laughs> you don't think this is French? This, this is the other whatever. thing we yeah. use film for, and it is so legitimately well made. Shots, all these. This is what people oh used to make God. movies about. Yeah, it's like this is a, this is proof that you can still have a story like this, and it can still be good and still be compelling. Just yeah. as compelling as something that has a billion green screen shots. Ugh. And also, like, the, like you said, the script. Like my favorite quote: how "I've never seen her smile." Mm. Oh have you God. tried yeah, being yeah. funny? Yeah, that's yeah. Like, <laughs> That was a great line. My and favorite line. The interaction between those three girls was just amazing. Well, and the entire way through. The maid, yeah. the, the girl the, yeah. Yeah. Just a, yeah. what a, a, this is a 300 movie. This yeah. is basically yeah. an isolated uh, story with three young women, two of which are going in and out of this love story. And one is a, a house, a house worker who mm. is just kind of giving context so that they're not totally alone. So there's something right. to play off of. And everyone was just so grounded. That scene where she goes um, and has a procedure yeah yeah and they it's stunning yeah. the way the mirrors for the scene that happens after it the don't look away segment yeah. the idea of not turning away 
from what is most difficult in your life. And again, they used metaphor to try to bring it to life with this theme, and it worked so well. And just this whole movie, I've already said like four examples here. It's just a good example of how I never felt like I was being pushed into pseudo-intellectualism with this mm -hmm. movie. You are still allowed mm -hmm. in this medium to use metaphor and to use themes to try to move story forward, especially in silence, and have it be something grounded in, yeah. and emotional. It doesn't have to be... This movie is not too smart for anyone right. to see. Everyone oh, can no. see and yeah. enjoy this movie. And mm -hmm. we're going to talk about Royal Affair too, but when was the last time you saw a really great romance? They mm -hmm. don't make them as much anymore. We don't take that chances a, on that. That was a good one. What a good I mean, romance. And she's movie. painting her. So obviously, like when when she's painting her, the detail, like when, what she sees, you see, and they're seeing each other, and they're clearly falling in love with each know, other. Dude. It's <laughs> like watching her paint someone that she's clearly having a, a complete affinity for, and then vice versa. The person who's just sitting there, and you just see behind the eyes, like there's more to it. Um, and I don't want to spoil this one particular tiny thing too much, but let's just say that she doesn't like the way she's painted because she tends to be painted looking unhappy. And the painter, to she's basically like, everybody paints me unhappy. And the painter has to be like, well, with her eyes, she can't say out loud. I was like, well, you're not happy, right? She can't say that, but you can tell that she wants to. So again, which there's again, all this the, subtext. There's all this stuff going on. That's which like, again, is the, that's what, it's another a gigantic theme because yeah. she ends up saying at the end of showing her first portrait, little spoiler alert, it's not going to change the movie. It's halfway through the movie. <laughs> Try to avoid it, yeah. That she's the, the woman being painted is saying, there's no life. Is that really how you see me? And yeah, they start talking. She says, well, you mm -hmm. know, smile is often. I yeah. think there was a larger commentary on this woman is about to have to go live a life she doesn't want to live. Yeah. She has never and, had control over her yeah. life. And that's the whole Do, point. Is that, is that not life? Yeah. I think that's the point they're trying to make. Not just women at that time period, not just women in general. Are you not allowed to have some kind of expression of life, even if you're not happy all the time? Mm -hmm. Again, I thought like it was a good thing for Americans to see this. Because I think a lot of times, a lot of my foreigner friends always point out that Americans are strange that we're always so over compensatory with our chipperness. Hi, how are you today? How yeah. are you doing? Like must, the, must like, be happy. Huh, yeah. See, yeah, <laughs> must be happy. Like life isn't life unless it is through a smile and something positive. I felt like the the final portrait that she reaches, I'm not, not going to give anything away, captures something that you have been waiting for her to capture. And it is not what you think it's going to be. And yet it is overflowing with the life that we have all mm. been watching evolve throughout this mm. whole thing. A separate point, I, I really loved the rhythmic style of the movie. It was rhythmic right. despite, and I can tell you that music does not feature a lot in this film. They, music, they use no. it They use it three times. and But the, the film, just the filmmaking and everything is so rhythmic the whole way through and it builds. And the, the three times they do use music, it's incredibly effective. And on the, yeah. on the flip yeah. side of that, the silence is done so well. And I'm, there's two kinds of silences in this film because there's no music used except for those three times. <laughs> there was only ambient silence. I mean, and two, the two times, one of them is singing. So, yeah. 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 And the ambient yeah. silence is very effective throughout. It just pushes you right into that place, that gritty indie kind of feel where you were just living in a house. And then there are certain times when they literally go to silence mm. where they're using. It's oh, almost yeah. like silence was the music in this film. Yeah. And every now and then they would go away to a complete yeah. static silence that just squeezed your heart. Right. I'm not used to that. I found myself yeah. looking around like it's something wrong. Yeah. And it's weird so seeing it. It's weird yeah. seeing the theater with so a lot of people too where it's that quiet and it's, it's cool. If it's yeah. Let me give just one more. My favorite line in this movie I, just, I cannot, mm -hmm. I've been thinking about it nonstop. Do all lovers feel as if they are inventing something? Yeah, oh cool. my God. When it's just getting to see this person and people both of them for different reasons, discover the who they are, the life that they actually do have inside them that maybe they're not allowed to show it, other yeah. if it's through me painting someone else or if it's this through this girl praying to God in a convent or being arranged mm -hmm. into this marriage she doesn't mm -hmm. want. I loved how we're talking about the aesthetic of this movie and how fucking beautiful it is, how much spit was there in their kisses. There was something so oh, yeah, spittle. yeah. There was, there was, weird. All, it was, it was like very purposely there was letting yeah. the spittle was like drain. There was something so physical about it. it I never real. thought that anyone smelled great or anything like that. I never felt like it, it didn't go cinematic with that at all. It was completely yeah. grounded. And yet, what came out of that? There was something. This was one of the most beautiful films I've ever seen without mm -hmm. all that stuff. Yeah, there, it was because of the absence of that that it was just them exposed, mm -hmm. and it was so gorgeous. All right, I'm going to bring us around to our comparative film, please. Yeah, I mean, yeah, we had nothing negative to say about that. Movie. Yeah. Go see a portrait. Of yeah, go it's, see. It's awesome. It's awesome. Yeah. Absolutely, it's not, go and it's, see it. It's not on the. It's because it's still in some theaters, so it'll be out soon. If you're yeah. in a major city, go see it. If not, 
put it on your list on Netflix or whatever. Guys, as a date night film, this is a winner. Oh, yeah. Just saying. Gentlemen yeah. or yeah. ladies, if this is a date night film, this is a winner. Or you could go yeah. alone and cry yourself to sleep. Jeff? <laughs> 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 that's funny that's funny um okay i suggested the next film as our comparison so we were we were thinking to compare it to a more popular film that maybe maybe was a little bit too on the nose or whatever but i decided to go for um the the, the wedding elements of the film of um portrait of lady on fire um actually it was funny that the painting was supposed to be a wedding gift is the yeah. portrait of her and then it's like why am i not happy and it's like this is what you get. You got somebody who doesn't want to be married to a stranger. Like, what, do you, what the fuck do you want? Uh, mm-hmm. Is that so crazy? So anyway, I went with A Royal Affair, which is a Dutch movie from 2012. And I actually saw it early on because luckily my family has good taste in movies. And my mom got it on Netflix back Den- when they actually... Denmark. Was Danish. it Dutch? Yeah, it's a Danish film. Oh my God, I'm so sorry. It's okay, D, same D. Yeah. Wow. Danish film. Danish film. Uh, my mom got it because it was that's, nominated that's, for an Oscar. Uh, that's for... near France. It's weird accents. <laughs> weird accents. Either way. Weird fucking accents. I'll, dr- I'll drink, but weird accents. Well, uh, for next week's episode, we're going to get a map on the wall. Shout out wow. to, to, to Vim Hoff. I've been doing his breathing exercises. They apparently haven't been working. Um, okay. So a royal affair. But, um, so my mom got this on discs back when people got Netflix on discs uh, because Ooh. it was nominated for Oscar and she loves um, historical fiction. So first things first, Alicia Vikander. We haven't seen her in a couple years and anything huge, but... This was her breakout movie. She was like 21. Did we figure this out? 22? I'll look it up while you talk. She booked this. She's Swedish. It's brilliant. So um, she is so fucking good in this movie. And I knew, I my, my appeal was actually that it was Mads Mikkelsen. This is 2012. So Mads Mikkelsen was in Casino Royale and he was in the Hannibal reboot on TV. Um, let's, so Let's not sell Mads short though. He was awesome. No, no, he was fine. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. But that, that's that's what got me in is I knew his name and then mm. she was the surprise. So anyway, long story short, this is a true story. This is a true story about a British princess. Yeah, Alicia was 24 when she did this. It was about a British princess in 1767. So good context for Americans. It was basically right around slash right before our American Revolution. My country wasn't even thought of yet. Sorry, Dave. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> I don't think about uh, you. So anyway, so. a British princess <laughs> was, um, sp- was betrothed an arranged marriage to a king of Denmark who was a young king. Um, and she was basically shipped off to Denmark and didn't know anything about him when she left. So Alicia Vikander, even though she's Swedish in real life, she played a British princess, sold to the Denmark king. I can say the sold here in this case. Yeah, um, yeah, pretty much. And then it turns out, this is this is the, it's not a spoiler, but anyway, the king is, is mad. He's not, they don't address it much in the movie and I'm glad they don't. So you can sort of decide for yourself. <laughs> Pretty much stopped developing it around That's 14. It. That's it. He's basically a teenager forever. Yeah. I mean, he likes to play hide and seek. He likes to play with dogs. He he is a, he's, he's just a very, he, he is not a, 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 a grown man. He's, he's a kid in a grown man's body. He's, he's mad. He's not well. And it's, it's not a negative criticism where I say I hated that guy because you're meant to until a certain point like i hated him with a fiery fucking passion i love that i love that on the second viewing um because i i I liked him more the second time to be honest i really was like Like, he was brilliant this is such a tricky role role, it's actually hateable this is a tricky role for an actor we'll get into it um so anyway long story short (laughs) again um british princess sold to the king of denmark so she is now the queen of denmark who is mad and she has an affair with the um german doctor who is played by mads mickelson um be, and yeah, they, they form a relationship and fall in love. And this is a true story. Um, her kids, their their father, the fatherhood of the kids become into question when people start, you know, assuming that she's having an affair with the doctor. It is an incredible story. We obviously loved it. John, take it away. I really love this movie as well. Once again, foreign film thing. Let's see. Uh, so the much more film thing. That's right. I mean, yeah. honestly, like I, I kind of hope we can have that conversation. This is so much more than a romance movie based on I, you had told me that you had pitched this movie to me before and I don't have a good excuse for why I had not watched mm-hmm. it yet I had read the little blurb about it on IMDb I thought this was a romance movie this is not just it a romance movie not a this romance. is so much more <laughs> so much more than romance a historical drama or any other genre or conventional corner that a more fearful, fearful director or producer team could have pushed this film into they said fuck that yeah. they subverted it entirely this entire film rides the line constantly between genres between style there are moments where you get the absolute 
cinematic wide shot wide coverage the historical dramas all the costumes there are moments where they're going they're working handheld creating this weird intimacy where it subverts the genre and you're really not sure if you're supposed to care more about the romantic tale or the uh political tale about everything that's happening with the the politics and and the ruling there was a huge story underneath all of this about uh, the two characters who are having the affair that actually end up having an enormous impact on Danish politics and yeah. and um, everything that's happening with the government and the disruption of the government. Mm-hmm. Disruption it's a, it's a lot government. about the Enlightenment, really. Yeah, so yeah. I think it's... Um, if w- w- I don't even want to try to put this into a, a single context of through a love story, all of this stuff comes out of it. This movie does a really good job of proving to you that, again, if you think... You're going into a movie as an American with a certain expectation of how you're going to label this movie so that you can understand it. This movie, without making you feel like you don't have to be too smart to watch this, this movie proves to you very gently and still cinematically that you can have a love story, a political drama, a historical drama, and some intrigue, and there's some thriller elements, and there's some very sincere, uh, there's some intellectual enlightenment elements of it. Good job. Jeff. <laughs> Damn it, fuck. Do I have to drink because I burp? That doesn't make sense. Sorry, it God. worked. It worked. And let me interject one more time, and then I'll send it over to Dave. Is that I think my criticism of Americans, the American filmmaking, especially in the studio system that does foreign film like historical fiction, they're basically doing the Wikipedia on film. This film is a Danish movie about basically a very, very pivotal moment in um, in Denmark's history. Um, and they they do it in such a way that is like they're not pandering they're not basically giving you the spark notes of what the book would have been they are showing you in a visual storytelling style that they rely on the actors thank god because the performances are so fucking good in this movie i mean the good news is because it's historically accurate we can't actually spoil the end of this movie so (laughs) yeah Yeah. Yeah. i mean i mean the the pre yeah and and this and the same thing i was like maybe this movie's too long and i it, it yeah it opens with dear children um you probably don't know who i am and it's the mom it's their mother right so you know that she's gonna get exit in some way shape or form like you know and obviously you know it's about an affair because it's called a royal affair the affair doesn't even happen halfway through halfway through the movie so it's basically just what's going on in denmark at the time where um they have a mad king they have um not not a senate what do they what do they call their um the royal court they have the royal yeah. court is basically in charge the court. but and so so it's basically like the guys. king is basically a prop for them um but yeah anyway it, it's just like it's so it's so brilliantly done the performances are so good what do you think of alicia i mean let's just i know i told okay so i told you this oh so my God, so dude. this is 2012 <laughs> A fifth element came out the fifth element the fifth estate came out the next year and then 2014 when ex machina comes out and danish girl was actually 2015 but man from uncle when all these movies were coming out i was like i this is the part i like remember telling you i said i saw this person in a movie and there was nothing like this in the world she's so good that she's actually swedish she didn't speak any um danish and she when she got the movie she had a lunch with the director and she thought she was going to have another audition i listened to a podcast about this it was great and the director told her... Wait, you listen to other podcasts? Oh, the, <laughs> i got to do my research. Um, the, the director of this film, whose name is... First of all, thank God they got Mads Mikkelsen. Nikolai you know, Arcel. You, yeah, you know the budget went up when they got the guy from Casino Royale, and who is now a Hollywood actor who's in TV, who's in Hannibal at the time. You know their budget got big, because this movie did not fucking spare any expense. Anyway, he told Alicia in Danish that she got the movie, and she didn't know Danish. She didn't know it, so she didn't even understand. She's so good that, like, she literally went from not knowing Danish at all to being the Danish princess and is brilliant, like, overnight. And so I was like, this person, like, she just missed the Girl with the Dragon Tattoo series and stuff. Like, all those great Swedish films, she just missed it. But when she came into Hollywood, I was like, she's I just... know she's going to take this town by storm. I just, I knew it, and I, I've i been a huge Alicia fan ever since I saw this movie. She's just one of those who transcends Every idea you think of how a part could be played, so she, she plays it, and then you realize no one else could ever do it like that. And yeah, it's oh my god, mm. like all every element. When of she it. walks up to him at the beginning of this movie, when they haven't met each other yet, and she finally lands yeah. in Denmark and she meets him. I'm sure there was makeup involved, but there's a long walking handheld shot in front of her where she's walking up to meet him in the grass. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and she's and curious she to just, see who she's going to meet. She meet just blushes, yeah. like a color appears in her face. Mm-hmm. And it gets all the way through. It's a, it, Again, this is not like a typical romance movie. So there's so many interesting turns. She's not the only protagonist. Like they, right. they, 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 they do kind of bounce around in this. 
and it all builds. Dave, I'll let you. I'll spin it off of this after we talk about this. She has a cry at the end of this movie where things turn very bad for her, and it sounds like an animal. It sounds like I I remember thinking it was the only moment that I kind of got taken out of the movie. I just didn't mind it because it was so impressive. I remember thinking everyone on crew when they heard her do that was probably like, "What the fuck? I've never." heard a human make that is that okay for us to put that on film it sounded like an animal or something and it was just one of those moments where i was like the sound guy's in the corner sucking his thumb like yeah right (laughs) dude there was can't she's everyone knew i think everyone who worked on this movie had no doubt this woman is going to be a superstar yeah superstar i i there's a scene where um the 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 matt again he's he's basically a 14 year old child but he's the king um in a man's body he just doesn't have the mental capacity to understand so he's he's with the child without her and she sees him and she it's maybe not his child i don't know anyway she like yells at him and grabs the child like, what are you doing what are you doing because he doesn't really know how to be a parent because he's a child and she's like you can never be alone with him again and she looks at him and i don't know about you but I've had this look before. <laughs> so oh. I have seen this look before. Stop yeah, touching you, children. Oh, no, 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 no. <laughs> Save it. <laughs> Fuck you. You drink. Drink for touching kids. <laughs> yeah. Wait, no, you have to drink. No, then we all drink. <laughs> yeah, you have to drink one of these penalty beers underneath for being an asshole. Um, oh. No, but I, I, it was like, because you know in the film acting, you're like, oh, I think she's mad. No, 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 no. I'm like, oh, I know that look. I know that look. Yeah, that's, I know that's, it. I, I never want to see it again. That's the and get out of the house look. I'm seeing yeah. it on a plane through my iPad. And I'm like, I thought I was never gonna have to look at this look again. Damn it! <laughs> like, it is brilliant. I'm she sorry, Dave. Always I'm, lives in the uncomfortable place. I'm Dave, raving. Dave, Dave, take it away. What do you think? I, I, it was so much more than I expected. I was expecting just the story of the affair, and there's so much like political intrigue. If there was ever a film that would make you go anti-establishment, this is it. Yeah. Because these guys are assholes, and they're manipulating every factor of life. They're trying to hold onto their power. What do you call their like the pre the credit scroll? Like right before the credit scroll, the postscript. The postscript. So. It's like I want you want to applaud the postscript after yeah. seeing this movie. You're yeah. like fuck yeah after yep. seeing this whole thing. It was uh. and the, and again, it's just not unlike a movie like a a, a spotlight or or which is great, or brilliant or movie, great like, movies. Those are different movies that are strictly what they are. You still are you you rely on the postscript on movies like that because you need someone to give you final context on how to move forward after being sitting through an informational movie. Why don't you need that for this? Because you fell in love with them along the way. You fell in love with Denmark. Mm -hmm. You fell in love with those individuals. You even fall in love with that crazy mad king by the end of it. And the the context that he's living in, if it was, he could not have become the person that the history views him as without him being supportive and understanding of this crazy affair that's happening in his life with these other people. You feel bad for him when he's separated from his friends. Mm -hmm. You feel bad. Real fast. We we praised Felicia. I just want to say Mads, is always rock solid. Always, I, I love the scene in the ballroom where he's he's moving like liquid silk, mm-hmm. and the king is just a buffoon. Mm-hmm. Like he's yeah. dancing. He's His got the moves. Like he and, and he is like yeah. the king of stillness. Yeah. Anyway, oh, yeah. And when he's looking at her through the mirror, because he knows he can't look at her. Like they don't do this stupid Hollywood thing where they're like making eyes across the room, and no, everybody no, no, who's there would look at it. He's like looking at her through a mirror. But we'll cool. say they there was a there are only a couple filmmakery techniques that are that are isolated in this movie. One of them is their meeting moment when they are dancing and it cuts to a completely different in-camera lighting setup that clearly fades up and it mm. goes like black all yeah. around them and they spin in slow motion just looking at each other. It shots had the world. It goes like West Side Story Cha Cha. Yeah, yeah. yeah. I mean, it's such a simple, simple technique, but because they had grounded the rest of the technique in something that seemed so much more realistic, right. so much more like neo-realism style, this heightened it dramatically. I knew this was coming up. And then just to get back to Matt's final thing, Ugh. I'm not going to tell you exactly <laughs> what happens to him at the very end, but when he has to face... His reckoning at the end of this royal yeah. affair, his final scene, just shows you why that guy's a fucking badass. You can't just be the biggest guy on set. You can't just have the most interesting look. You can't just say lines in a deep, low, gruffy voice. Right. To have the range to do what he does as an actor at the end of his mm. final scene just shows you that this movie is on a different level. And they didn't it, just cast a type. They cast great actors. A type. I mean, he's not that handsome. So it's like it's funny that you're like, this guy's... You want this to work out so bad. She's 24 and and the most beautiful person in the world. And he's the villain from Casino Royale. And it's like, it's the eyes. You just sit there and you like, you just want it. Guys, we're full of love. Go see these movies. We're all yeah. so love. We're holding hands right now. I mean, you can, you can rent this thing. Mm-hmm. Right Do now. it tonight. Enjoy it. There's not enough love in the world right now. Go watch both of these movies. And remember that love is what it's really all about. We'll be right back with our next segment. We're back. 
Welcome back. It's time for our next segment. How the fuck did they do that? How, How the did they fuck do, that? do that? How the fuck did they do I that? I left out that they. So Dave our has had some beer. Oh, there's been a lot of buzzers in the first couple of segments. Yeah, we're Great. feeling really groovy. We are going to talk about that movie that I loved so much, Birds of Prey. Yeah. You did not love that, you fuck. See, we, we should have gotten John drunk before he started talking about it, because he actually seemed somewhat... Jet- no, he didn't. Never mind. Fuck Acting! <laughs> okay. So Dave, <laughs> our film connoisseur, DP, direction, color artist, uh, audio tech, uh, I don't do visual audio effects... <laughs> Whatever. Anyway, Porn sound fluffer. mixing. <laughs> fluffer. <laughs> the one thing we can't agree on about Birds of Prey. The one thing we can't agree on is that the, no, we're not going back. the stunts in that movie were awesome. So okay. we are going to zero in and talk about how the fuck did they do those I stunts, mean, Dave? Straight up, can I just say prior to uh, Jeff's previous comment, there's nothing wrong with the fluffing. Uh, that is a perfectly respectable. There's never anything um, wrong with fluffing. Um, it's yeah, just, it's just the time period right that's now. wrong. In the past, fluffers were great. And then in the future, I think fluffers are going to be. But right now, fluffers, fluffers are out. Right now, it, does, it seems society has turned their back on fluffers. Fluffers. <laughs> fluffers. Never turn your back on the fluff. How Wait, many did, times can we, we say fluffers we, in 30 should seconds? Should we reiterate? <laughs> no excuse for us to man. Should we reiterate the, the parental advisory? My, I know my parents are proud. I don't know about you. Yeah. Uh, <laughs> fluffers. Okay. So, Dave, let's talk about Birds of Prey and the stunts, specifically. Uh, the Jeff's, Jeff's parents, if you're still listening, my name is John. <laughs> uh, hello. Dave, talk hello, about man. the stunts. God damn Can it. I like- <laughs> They hired the John Wick team to do stunts for Birds of Prey. Well, they, they did. They brought back the, one of the stunt coordinators to do the show. Um, so basically, cool. um, the sequence that I looked up and researched, and there's some wonderful articles out there on this, uh, was the carousel sequence. And it's not just for the sake of the stunts. Um, the girls did do their own stunts, a lot of them. Um, mm. I would say probably 60 70%. Uh, oh. There's some stuff that's too dangerous, obviously. To let the way, they they filmed it. it with all those long takes, so like they kind of had to, right? Like Keanu uh, did in John Wick. Yeah, pretty much. There's, I mean, there, where there are cuts, and this is where it gets really fun. Um, in the carousel sequence, the stage is spinning. That's yeah. So your background is <laughs> yeah. different. So it turns out. So yes. if you are like, I don't know whether you notice, but if you watch the film again, uh, all the hands that are on the outside yeah, yeah, yeah. have numbers painted on them. Ooh. They're literal clock hands. So they started at a point in the clock here and started the thing rolling and they had to be finished that sequence of action by the time the clock hit there. Would so, they paint them out? Like this is, we, No, they left them there. They're, they're painted on the bottom of the hands, on the wrist. You can see the numbers in the and film. And was it, was it divisive for them in the filmmaking process it was, of it? It was or both. Was it, it was, it was part us? of an art direction thing and cool. also um, they used it as a device to sync up the takes because when Pretty you cool. cut from so one this take is, to just another. Just to clarify, this is in the Wonder House, right? The fun house at the very yeah. end when they come onto the bottom level, mm-hmm. right? Okay. And there's roller skates and the, yeah. the entire stage is yeah. spinning. Harley gets into roller skates and they say, oh, I guess you made a shoe change. Yeah. Right? yeah. Who had time for that? a shoe change? <laughs> did they kill a dog like they did in John Wick? Because that's fucked up. No, they did not kill Thank a dog. Thank God this movie was awesome. Great. Did you John miss awesome. the point where the hyena turns up again? I oh, love yeah. the hyena. Like, oh, yeah. Fun. Harley Quinn gets a hyena, and that's funny. That's like, funny. That is funny. I'll give you that. that is okay, funny. sorry, Dave. So, yeah, a hyena called Bruce. So, talk us to, so okay, so we no, have we have a rotating stage. We're in a fun home. Harley Quinn on yeah. roller skates. Basically, uh, these. <laughs> Let's make this movie. These women. Yeah, these, <laughs> these women pitch. trained for, I would I want to say, about four months, because mm-hmm. uh, that's about when they started the previs on the, the, con- the concept of the fights. So, they went in, and the stunt guys previous all the stuff they fought it through they lined it up and then came time to shoot they realized that because it's a spinning set you need to have for the edit points the same background from when you like when you cut from one to the other so they developed the Dave's getting so excited that his chair is squeaking. He's wiggling around so much. I think we need Dave's fluffer. I I stopped Um, moving. He's getting too excited here. I think you literally Damn it, my parents are never going to listen to my fucking podcast again. Um, <laughs> Dave, stop squirming in your squeaky seat. <laughs> Somebody oil me. Okay. God damn it. Yeah? yeah? I don't know. <laughs> I lost it. Wait, hold on a second. Hold on a second. Dave, Dave, like, Dave the, you make movies, and then I'm just is interjecting the guy, on his Is segment. the guy we're discussing, Rocky Abu Sakir, is he the stunt coordinator? I was looking up the stunt guys. And I he don't was the think first so. One is no. he the director of the first John Wick movie? Actually, all of them. Is yeah, the, the director I mean, of the John Wick the movies? The, the, the yeah. company was uh, 8711 Action right, Design. I, look it up. I have two names here, actually, so I'm going to go with Chad Stahelski. Yeah, it's a Chad. You can tell Chad it's a Chad. Chad Stahelski, the stunt coordinator. He was the director and stunt coordinator for John Wick, oh, sure. mm-hmm. supposedly, and he will be... He's the stunt coordinator for... 
uh, Birds of Prey as well. Is that what you're saying? I think he was brought back for reshoots, I believe. For reshoots? Yeah. So not the original? So, yeah, no. They Well, they, they jazzed, when they came back, they jazzed up the So are you uh, the saying sequences. they filmed this this sequence and then like other heavy, stunt heavy sequences and then they said not good enough and they called this guy? Yeah. That's... I think they're just. I think nowadays with these movies, especially like the Star Wars movies, and especially you the these reshoots. movies, yeah. they they literally are like, all the actors take two months off, and we're gonna need you again because we just have a feeling we're gonna have to go full solo on all these movies. <laughs> <laughs> um, okay, wait, wait. Let's. I want to talk a little bit more about how they actually pulled off the effects because I think, especially when stunt teams are involved, most of it has to be practical. So not only did they it, train, yeah. and, not, and so now we have a rotating set too. So obviously the rehearsal has to be out of control, but also the lighting, like everything, gets affected when you have a rotating set. It does. Yeah. Um, did you? Was there any, like what? What does somebody do when they step into this film like later? Also, this is the this is the they sort of previs the, the fuck out of it. Like they yeah. they really had to pre plan this stuff, and that's mm-hmm. I mean that's where the numbers on the hands came from. Um, that was their work around for what, edit points. What does their shot but, list look like? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> makes sense. I see. mean, stunt crews. They don't yeah. get the shout out they really should get. Like they, sure. they really they, don't. No, they need an Oscar category. They do care about the the I guess the acting of it, but the realism of it. So they are they're not just like looking to see where they land. They're really giving themselves over to the stunt. So like if yeah. they're falling backwards, they're not looking back to see where they're landing. They're just trusting the system, mm-hmm. and because they are acting their asses off, even though you don't see their faces, mm-hmm. they're acting their asses. I off. mean, if you, it's an unwritten rule that if you do see their faces, that's the end of their contract. Yeah. because they're usually killed in the next scene invisible right. like, not people. for real but like the character is killed yeah. so this segment is called how the fuck do they do that and a lot of times we're going to be discussing technically how impressive it was they do that there are some things in movie making that have to do with a human risking something to get it on camera and that's what these stunt people do every fucking time they get on set yep um dave i'm sure we're gonna be talking about stunts and effects and such that your expertise will come in handy on for the next film we'll be talking about um anything to wrap up birds of prey and their incredible stunt team uh, no, just they did an excellent job. Mm-hmm. Um, I feel like they were completely on point. Love that. Um, and yay, yeah, studies. I'm all yeah, for them. studies, dude. Hell I have yeah. a lot of friends who are studies. I really respect the job. Sweet. Yeah. Let's get into our redemption. So every week we are going to redeem a quote unquote bad film. Bad uh, film. Yeah. Bad film. Um, and the metrics for the next film. Let's see. Do I have them up? Whoa, okay, so um, okay, it's got a five point two rating on IMDb on on Rotten Tomatoes. I believe it's seventeen percent. It came out last year in twenty nineteen. You may have get missed a 5. it. I don't know how you missed it. Sorry, Greg. Oh, oh, nobody knew this movie came out last year. So that's, that's the really the worst part about it. The movie is. Hellboy. 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 Now, here's the thing. Really quick. There was a Hellboy in 2004 starring Ron Perlman. Also, that was shout, great. Out, shout out John Hurt and Summer Blair. 81%. It had a sequel, Hellboy 2, The Golden Army. That was not... 2000, <laughs> 2000, sorry. 2008 has an 86% on Rotten Tomatoes. So, fair to say, critically successful first series. 2004. Guillermo did those, right? And he did. 2008. 10 years later, well, 11, in 2019, we decide that the guy from Stranger Things, the only adult male, David Harbour, should be Hellboy, (laughs) and it has a 17%. What the fuck happened, Dave? What the fuck happened indeed? So this is based off of comics. Do you know the comics? I do not. No. Okay. I I never read Hellboy. Um, I I must say, though, that David Harbour looked great. Like, the makeup team, that was, like... I'm pretty sure all practical or mm-hmm. mostly practical. He looked phenomenal as the character. I feel like he really did his homework too. I'm just going to go ahead and Wasn't say. Wasn't really given a lot to work with. Uh, no, this is, this is maybe the worst script to ever, ever be put. In Thank you, Dave. <laughs> this is maybe the worst. All right, script let's to just ever fucking be- lean into this. All right. Cause I've, I've seen the first two as well. I've watched this one recently. I think the problem with Hellboy is baked in to Hellboy, the character. Nobody knows what to think of hellboy it's it's just i have a feeling because i've never read it either i have a feeling it was e- an easier read to digest yeah. than it is as a movie i'm still i've seen all three of these movies now and i'm not sure how we're supposed to feel about hellboy these movies don't have a point of view that's that's the problem i'm just not quite sure what we're supposed to think i actually think this one hellboy. did it was just so much reverie that it was like off-putting in a way you know what i mean it was just that's like, what i'm saying was they it wanted him to seem like your best friend who doesn't I mean, want to be like I mean, the devil the, reincarnate or whatever the like, thing that really pissed me off was i can't pinpoint exactly why it was so bad even its flaws didn't fit together i know it's supposed to be fun this movie's yeah. supposed to be fun he comes back from the underworld and also he they, they're trying so hard with the jokes they're trying so hard with all oh, the jokes. there was some zinger so, one-liners that's what I'm saying. why would you try that hard with the jokes when you know the rest of your movie doesn't have a strong enough point of view that you're not sure how people are supposed to feel about anything so you just 
just want them to laugh. But I want to open this up. Okay, so here's it. We, we really thought this movie would be fun, bad. We really did. We didn't come into this redemption se- sequence hoping to shit on a movie. Um, it's shot well. It's acted pretty well. There's, it's like technically there's funny. nothing terrible about okay, it. Okay, the opening line. Here's the opening line. It's a voiceover. God, and they it's basically, a bad bro. Yeah, that like, exposition yeah. is terrible. This, this, is is great. Damn it. this is a narration. Here we go. This is it. Quote, the year is 517 AD, known as the Dark Ages. And for good fucking reason... Boo. That is the opening <laughs> of the movie. Also, you know that one of my one of my biggest pet peeves in movies is when they take known characters in either literature or lore and they create a bullshit story that's fucking ridiculous. Like, mm. oh, thanks, <laughs> it's amazing. King Arthur is all up in yeah, this like, story. Oh, Merlin and, and King Arthur, you think you know the story, but uh, actually we're going to exploit them for some weird, stupid, fucking convenient way for us. Hellboy isn't interesting <laughs> enough. <laughs> Hellboy isn't interesting enough to stand on its own. So we have to use Arthurian lore oh, so to like, make it relatable. Yeah, they're like Merlin and Arthur. They're like, oh, and Merlin might still be alive. He was buried alive because he was actually treacherous. Everybody drink like, oh, for five seconds. This movie's a piece of shit. Stop. I can't bear to see you do this to yourself. <laughs> Oh my god, dude! Anyway. And how much do you love Ian McShane? I love Ian that guy. I love him. I love him saying anything. So when I was watching this exposition, this intro scene to this movie, I was sitting there thinking, I can't wait to see Ian McShane on film. I hope he gets here sooner. And I'm so sorry that he has to be a part of this because the intro to that movie. Mm-hmm. Could not have been a worse advertisement for how terrible this movie is going to be. <laughs> <laughs> okay, I listened to I listened to a really funny podcast. We, we're all about comparisons here on this podcast. I listened to a really funny um, interview with Eddie Murphy, where they're basically like Dolomite. They're basically like Eddie. What do you think? Like we feel bad, but what do you think about movies like Norbit, where you clearly paid a lot of money and the movies were bad? And he was like, any movie I made twenty million dollars is a fucking hit in my house. I feel like with Ian Shane, Ian McShane, and basically. There are there are other times where it's like you could just tell this actor was like, wait, I can shoot in LA and I can go home at night and all I have to do is read these shitty lines for like a month. Can you imagine making a million dollars to commute from home and like have your weekends off? Like if I'm Ian McShane, I'm sitting there and I was like, I know if this movie sucks, it's not my fault. So fuck dude, it. Like, let's, let's go. Oh, let's be clear. We're picking on it. I am not. I want to clarify. I am not picking on any of the performances. The woman who plays the I witch am. is incredible. There are oh some. Of, no, me. Uh, she Bobby Yaga. Like, she was giving it. Everything she had. That was, that was one of my favorite sequences, actually. Should Mila Djokovic? That's Mila? Oh, that was Mila. Okay, no, Mila no, no. Djokovic, bro. I, the Baba Yaga sequence with the, the oh, house cool. on legs. That yeah. was... Actually, the exteriors were great. I that love I love great. that. That one was yeah. great, too. What's her name? Uh, Penelope Mitchell? Gennaida? Mm. She, is that sure. her? Is that what we're talking about? The character? Gennaida? Was that her name? I can't remember. A creepy character. Penelope Unbelievable. Mitchell, there yeah, were, there were so many... It was a good example of... All right. I'm about to lean into it, so you can tell her Jake if you want to. Okay, go on, go on a rant. Spectacle-driven action movie hero films. This is why we don't give enough credit to the successful good Marvel movies. This is not an easy genre to pull off and do it really well. Yeah, anyone can make one singular good action sequence. Anyone can make some crazy costumes and put a bunch of fucking CGI in a movie. <laughs> it's hard to do an entire movie that, that is the backbone of it and do it well. This is a good example of what I'm talking about. The performances were strong. Nobody was right. bad in this. Moment to moment, I that's bet they true. thought Wait, they were making a good true. movie. I bet when they were filming this, they thought, we have a chance to make a good movie here. There's nothing that bad about this. It, it felt like everyone felt like that. Yeah. yeah. Did they everyone. read the dialogue? Did they read the lines? That's what I'm saying. It was just like, it was just, <laughs> like, it was just the script. Every every producer will tell you. Every this director will tell dialogue you. dialogue was You don't take a movie to shit. green light unless the script is strong. I don't understand why they didn't... <laughs> Jeff, Jeff loved this movie, dude. <laughs> yeah. Really. Here's it. the thing. I love horseshit dialogue. You know what else I love? You know what else I love? And I think most people at home love. So think about this. Maybe turn it into a drinking game if you're having a weird night. Anyway, some of the worst British accents to ever make it to the screen. I'm sorry. Daniel Day Kim, who you may know from Lost or Hawaii Five-0. Yeah, also, he American? Millionaire. Well that? known. He... That is one of the worst British accents to ever I, be I don't on think film. He's British, also, right? I feel like he's... and also the, the the girl, I forget her name. Um, she's gonna be a huge star, I'm sure someday. But she like those those two British accents were like it was basically like somebody gave them a cold read and said, "Oh no, they're supposed to be British." And they went, "Oh sure, I got a British in my back pocket." And they just like haven't done it in two months, and so it's it really felt. And also the line writing for British, they're like, "Oh well, bollocks to you then, sir." Like they clearly like it was it an American me, writing it. It is making me wonder if. Uh, 
because anyone who who knows about this stuff, if you don't know about it, most of the major uh, spectacle driven films that are under the DC or the Marvel universe are being shot in studios outside of London. So there is a, a given British audience. And if you're ever going to go on location outside of the studios, a lot of times they're shooting in Britain and in different parts of the UK. So I think sometimes I feel like they're, they, they feel like they have to make them be British to justify where they are. But again, look at what the Marvel movies do successfully and what the Star Wars movies do successfully. You don't have to be British to believably be shooting in a place that has gray overtones. Jeez, I can't wait for the next two then because they're shot in Australia. Oh, yeah. Good. Yeah. God damn it. Or, or, or like, guys, like, you having a hey, fucking hey, fight? Hey, or, like, hey, or like Paths of Glory where it's oh, shot in glass, France. Yeah. It's in France, but none of them have they have American accents. Um, well, okay, well, hold on a second. So to our film fans, this director, Neil Marshall. So he did The Descent. I kind of like The Descent. Interesting movie. Guess what? It's about um, a bunch of girls that go splunking. They go cave diving. And it just so happens that that cave that they're splunking in is a uh, door to the underworld and these creatures from the underworld come and try to take them down very similar to what's going on in Hellboy which we haven't even given you the plot honestly it's not worth our time what's that one <laughs> um, but here's the thing so Neil Marshall though think about this so I kind of thought I was like wait a second Ooh. he directed The Descent and then sold out that makes total sense he directed two of God damn it. I, I was saying that was a preface to what I was about to say, asshole. You do have to drink one of these fucking beers for you being an asshole. <laughs> fucking trigger happy Australian. Trigger Australia. happy Australian <laughs> motherfuckers. Really he's laughing so hard. He's trying to drink his like cutter beer. Drink it, beer, bitch. Uh, drink anyway, <laughs> so Neil Marshall, the director of this, directed two of the best and biggest set yep. piece Game of Thrones episodes. He directed Blackwater and Watchers on the Wall. Uh, Watchers on the Wall is all CGI. It's all the Night's Watch against um, the Wildlings, including the giant sequence. Where he the guys... did an enormous episode of Hannibal, the Great Red Dragon, did, which is yes, a penultimate. I think, Shout I out to um, Mads Mikkelsen. He did The Stray. That is, I think is a penultimate episode of Westworld. Fuck Westworld, but yeah, that's sure. That's I great. love Westworld. Oh, yeah, Westworld's job is to make you confused and fuck in each other. Well, so we'll they don't want to Clearly, make sense. this guy. They okay, don't have enough a topic. Point. We get enough topic. Come here. Clearly, bring it back. this bring guy back. is marketable. Clearly, he knows what he's doing. Everybody watch Westworld. So here's so here's my question to you two. Because so John, you direct and write movies. Dave, you you also direct and write movies, but you primarily have worked in post production and DPing work. Neil Marshall knows how to direct a good script. Blackwater, Rogers in the Wall, all the stuff we just talked about. Those are good scripts. Did he not know that this was a bad script? Like, I don't understand. Did he think that he could salvage this? Did he say, all we need is just whatever, like, all we need is some lines that connect the plot and then I'll do whatever. Like, what did he think when he was making this movie? You, Dave, you don't even think the effects were particularly good. I No. So like, if the movie, mm, if, okay. yeah, no, 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 that's fine. So if he, if his job is like, well, the effects, the that whole, the lore of, of this character that nobody gives a shit about, that's enough. And then it's like he doesn't even pull that element off what what happened here what fell apart i i honestly can't tell you like i said the the only thing that saves this movie is there's one line of dialogue that saves this movie <laughs> oh, <wait>. and it's <laughs> only like, one line only yeah, one yeah, only one line there's of so yeah. there's so she's many like, singers she's pitching what she wants to do and she wants to like take over the world and he's like it's not going to work i'm a capricorn and, and you're, you're fucking, fucking nuts. nuts yes it was so good Redeems the entire movie. Wait, in my the opinion. performances are strong, dude. Yeah. All right. I don't even know if we should watch. I'm not even so, going to tell you you should watch this movie, but if you watch it, make sure you're nice and drunk or a little stoned. Get whatever you like to do. Don't watch this movie sober, but yeah, watch do it. Not enjoy yourself. And you know what? Poor David Harbour, man. He needs something yeah. other than Stranger Things. Oh, no. He's, he's good. I mean, he and be the Djokovic dessert. I mean, she has money, so I'm not like anybody with money. I'm not like I don't feel bad for them when they cry to their like vacation home. But she really wanted this movie to be good. And Ian McShane honestly like you know what I mean like he, so much style he sat yeah. there and he, he me, Mila Djokovic wanted this to be good Ian McShane didn't give a fuck if it was bad and that's yep. cool we're wrapping up we're done join us in our next episode when we are going to watch The Way Back and Invisible Man and you know what let's give a shout out to the film that we are going to redeem huh oh that's gonna be fun Dave are you excited about this one I'm, I'm a little excited about it I, yeah it's uh, MIB International that's right Men in Black International did you see it of course you didn't that's why we're gonna talk about it <laughs> right but it's available on HBO uh, one of the streaming yeah, services it's on I HBO do think now, it's, I think I think it's on HBO yeah. Go maybe yeah. HBO you have two now. weeks to watch it before we drink a lot while talking about it um, I think that's it Jeff Dave John I'm feeling toasty we'll see you next time that was fun 